Massing diagrams have become a really popular way to describe the design process associated with a project. You can see these on high profile architecture websites like B.R. Kingle's group. Um, but they're also, of course, a really important part of the process early on in a project when you're trying to assess the impact of constraints like property lines and setbacks and floor area ratios. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at ways that Revit can be used to not only display the really impressive looking forms and graphics, but maybe more importantly to track, display, and calculate some of the data associated with the design process at this early phase. And more importantly, uh, we're going to look at the ways that Revit sort of leverages that I in BIM, the information of building information modeling, and makes this data par parametric so that as you're sort of working through different iterations, uh, you can sort of see the impact of moving some of these floor masses around and uh, make some decisions about the design as you go forward. So the assumption that's usually made at this stage is that because we're creating a massing diagram, we should be using Revit's default massing tool, which you can see over here on the left, the in-place mass tool. What it gives you, though, is just a semi-transparent volume that you're then meant to attach components like floors or roofs or walls to. We want something simpler than that. You can see that here in this diagram, We've just got a simple single volume here to represent the floor or the use on the floor. And the way that I've done that is I've just created a custom floor type that matches the depth of the level. So if I click here on my top residential floor, you can see that I've labeled it as my seventh floor residential. And then I've got additional ones for my sixth floor and my fifth floor. So a unique type for each level. And then you can see that if I go to the properties for those floor types, I've just created a depth here that matches the depth of the level, so 3,000 millimeters of thickness. Uh, I've also then attached a material, which is just basically a color that just kind of designates what the use or the category would be. So for all of my residential tower floors, I've got a special material assigned to those. And then again, as I said, you can see that they all sort of match the depth of the level. Um, I've also got some floor types down below here for my main floor where, where I want to have some kind of double height, higher ceiling spaces. You can see that I've just set those to be uh, 6,000 millimeters in their thickness. So pretty simple. Um, I'm just using floors instead of masses here to represent uh, each of these volumes. And that allows me then to see some crucial information about each of those floors or about each of those levels. So you can see here that it's tracking in addition to uh, some other values, uh, the area. And that's going to be the most important factor that I then uh, incorporate into my schedule so that I can calculate my floor area ratios. I've also created a floor type here for the site. So the edges of this floor type match the property lines. Uh, I've got this set to 150 millimeters worth of thickness, just to kind of mimic the typical thickness of a sidewalk. And you can see once again here that Revit's tracking the area. So I'll be able to use that information when I do my calculations for my floor area ratio. And then just one last final point to make here. I've also, to create my context model, created a sidewalk floor type, which is just 150 millimeters worth of uh, just a generic material here, to represent my curbs and sidewalks. And then I've also got another one below it just to represent the streets here or the asphalt. So that's the simplest way I would say that we can sort of represent the forms, generate the graphics, and then of course, more importantly, have the data that we need uh, to do the calculations later on. So the next intermediate step here before we actually get to doing the calculations that are shown here in the schedule is I want to just label each of these floor components. So I'm going to start with a 3D view and just first of all crop it. I don't need to see this much of my neighborhood here. I'm just going to click down below in my view control bar on the show crop region. And then I'll just click on the cropping frame and use these little blue grips just to kind of shrink this down to, like I said, just kind of my focus area. And uh, once I've done that, Revit will then give me the option here of locking this view. And when the view is locked, I can then add some tags to it. Uh, if you tried to do some tagging, uh, for example, if you clicked here on tag by category, you get this prompt here that let you know that you had to lock the view first. So uh, set the crop region up to show just what you need it to. Uh, and then I'm also going to make another little adjustment here where I change the scale. Uh, at the moment here, you can see that the default is that this is set to a 1 to 100 scale. And I'm just going to change that to 1 to 500. It's just a diagram, so it doesn't really have to be that large on the sheet. I want to make that fairly small. And uh, once I've done that, then I can just click on this little icon down below on the view control bar. And if I click on that, I've got the option here to save the orientation and to lock the view. If you'd been using a default view, it would prompt you for a name. Uh, you can see that I've already got my name here over in my browser. So I didn't see that prompt, but just uh, name it. 
and then after that you're ready to start tagging. Uh, if you go to the annotate tab and then just click on tag by category, uh, it might bring up a floor tag here by default. If it doesn't, you just need to make sure that you go here first to the insert tab and then on load family, you would just make your way in your library to the libraries. I'll just choose English for language here, US, and then under annotations, choose architectural. And then you can see here that there's an M floor tag type. So I'm going to be starting with that. It's already in my file, so I'm just going to hit cancel. And once I've done that, you can see that Revit just uh, figures out that I want to tag the floor. So it hovers over that. Uh, the default, I believe, for most situate most, most templates is that you'll have kind of a two-point leader line. So just remember, uh, as you place that, you'll want to just be aware of that intermediate click that you have to make. Uh, I'm placing the tags outside of the cropping region, so I've got the nice white background here. They'll be a little bit more legible and easy to understand. Now, after having placed that first one, you can see that it just labels the type. It doesn't give me uh, the area, which is maybe something that I want to add to this uh, floor tag. So in order to see the area displayed, I just need to bring up the properties here for this RFA file for this floor tag. And I can do that by just clicking down below here in my project browser, uh, expanding annotation symbols, and then finding my M underscore floor tag right here and then just right clicking on it and selecting edit. So if I click on edit, you'll see that it'll take me into the RFA environment. And if I click here on this label, I'll have the option here of editing the label. And I can then just scroll up here in my categories and select area and click on the little green arrow in the middle here just to send that over to the right. So now this label will display the type name and the area. And one last thing I'm gonna do here before I click okay and send this back to the RBT file, is I'm just going to click on this little button down below here, which are the unit formats for the parameter. And I'm going to uncheck use project settings. I'm going to make sure that just it still says square meters, but I'm going to display two decimal points. And I'm going to make sure that it displays meter squared for the unit symbol. So having done all that, I'll click OK a couple times. If you want to make further edits to this and change the font or the size of the text, you would just click here on edit type. Once that's all done, you can just click on load into project. It'll send it back to your RBT file, choose the right one. I'll click OK, and then I'll get this little prompt here. Just wanted to know if I want to overwrite the existing version and its parameter value. So I'll take that bottom option, and now you'll see that that tag displays not only the label here indicating the name of the type or the floor, but it also gives me the area. So having done that for all my floor levels and arranged them as I like, I'll be able to display something that looks a little bit more like this. Okay, so I've skipped ahead a little bit here and uh, tagged all of my floors. Uh, I should point out here that if you find yourself in a situation like this where you've got stacking text, you would just go back to the label. And uh, if you just grab the grips at each end and drag them out, it will then allow you to have text that spreads out more uh, horizontally. So if I load this back into the project here, choose my right RBT file, and then just do the overwrite, you'll see that now these text elements should spread out a little bit more. So. Uh, that's, of course, a need of a little bit of refinement. I'll get to that later. Uh, the next step would be going to my sheet and then just dragging that view onto my sheet. And uh, when that's complete, uh, I'll be ready to start creating my schedule. Before I do that, though, there's a little in bit of information that I need to make sure is available to the schedule. And uh, to do that, I have to go to my Manage tab and create a new parameter. So on the Manage tab, you'll see over here towards the left, there's a button here for Project Parameters. So having clicked that, I'll just click Add. And I'm going to call this new parameter Site Area. And I'm going to make sure that that's an instance parameter. Uh, down below here where it says Type of Parameter, I'm going to make this Area. And then I'm just going to go with the option here where values can vary by group instance. So Site Area, Instance, Area for Type of Parameter, values can vary by group instance. And then over here on the right, I'm just going to check the box here for Floors. And click OK. So what that does is it sets up a condition now where in my 3D view uh, I can click on my floor objects and you'll see that I now have a new field available in my properties window under analysis results where I can enter the site area. And I'm just going to do that based on the information here that's being tracked as we've seen on a couple of occasions uh, for the floor which is going to be this number here 2153.957. So I'm actually just going to add one last little tag so that I can actually see that displayed a little bit more visually. So I'll tag by category here and just include a, a site tag. 
and based on my units for my project you can see that's rounding it off here to two decimal points so now like I said what I'll do is I'll select each one of these floor plates so the site area I'll hold down my control button and I'll select as I said each one of these and then I want to enter that site area in that new field or that new parameter that I just created so right here where it says site area I'll just enter 2153.96 and now we're ready to start creating our schedule. To create the schedule, we want to just go to the View tab. And then over here on the right, on the Create panel, just click on Schedules and select Schedule slash Quantities. And we want to choose the category here for Floors. And once we've done that, we'll just click OK. And it's going to ask us here to populate our schedule with fields. And we're going to start with Type. Down below, we'll just choose type, and anytime we select any of the ones on the left, we just have to send them over to populate our new schedule by clicking on this button here. So we'll choose type, and we'll choose area, and we're going to choose site area. And remember, this is the new parameter that we made. Uh, this wasn't here before, so we'll just click on the green arrow and send that one over. And then we need just one last final uh, field, and we're going to do that by clicking down below here on add calculated parameter. So this is one that doesn't exist. This is a custom one. It's going to be based on a formula that we enter. So click on Add Calculated Parameter. And for name, we're just going to enter FAR for Floor Area Ratio. And under Formula, we're just going to click on the three little buttons over here, or three little dots here on this button on the right. And we're going to select Area and click OK. And then we're going to add a space and a slash. And then we're going to hit Space again. And then we're going to click on that little button, or uh, button with the three dots once again and just choose site area. So that, of course, is what floor area ratio is. It's a calculation of the total floor area for the building or for an individual floor uh, over the site area. So now we're going to click OK, and we've got all the elements that we need ready here. I'm just going to click OK and show you the initial result uh, and talk about some refinements that we have to make. Uh, remember that as soon as you're done creating that schedule, it's going to take you automatically to that view. If you want to zoom in on that a little bit, just hold down your control button and use your scroll wheel. So you can see just the initial results here of creating that new schedule. Uh, we have a list here of all of our floor components in the file, uh, a display here of the areas that they occupy. And then for the floors that we selected, uh, you can see that there's a display here of the site area. And with that number in place, it does a calculation then based on that formula that we entered to give us the floor area ratio. So as I said, this is the initial output. What I'm gonna do now is just jump over to a finished schedule and just go through some of the settings that uh, help us get to something that looks a little bit more like this. So if I jump over to my floor area ratio calculation schedule, you'll see when I click here on my edit button, um, same fields that we saw before. And if I just keep moving across, you'll see that I first use the filter tab to block out all of the floor types that I don't need to see in the schedule. So if you just filter by type, enter does not equal, you can then look for the names of those floor types that you don't want to have appear in your schedule, like, for example, the sidewalk and the asphalt and the site. Now, the site information we need to see, but we don't actually need to see a row for that site floor plate in the schedule. So that's why we've included it here as well. So make those uh, three set or set those three things so that we don't see those three floor plates. And then we'll move across here to sorting and grouping. And we just have to specify here that we want to sort by type so that we see the name here of the floor first. And you can see that I was careful here to just use numbers for each of the floors so that it ascends from the lower levels up to the upper levels. So sort by type, ascending. And then we're going to check the box here for grand totals, and we'll actually set the settings for those grand totals on the next tab. Uh, but we're just going to make sure that we have grand totals checked, title count and totals, and then enter a custom bit of text here so that it displays uh, the word total down below on the left. Having done that, we'll click on the Formatting tab, and we specify properties here for each of these fields. So for Type, we're just going to make sure that we have uh, whatever alignment we want. I've got this set to left, but that's just personal preference. And uh, we'll move now to the next one, which is Area. We want to actually see a total down below all of the individual area rows. So in order to see the display of this number here, we just have to make sure that we specify that we want Calculate Totals to be visible. Uh, and now we'll move over to site area. And here we don't need to see a calculation. We don't want all these adding up. We want to just kind of go with the default display that repeats uh, for the assumption of what the site area is. 
And once again, just specify whatever alignment you want uh, based on your personal preferences. Uh, the last step here is we're just gonna go to the FAR field. And here's where we want to just click on the field format button. And we wanna uncheck default settings, set the units to fixed, and just make sure that we have two decimal places. We don't need to see the four decimal places that it would otherwise display. So we'll click okay for that. And uh, now that we've done that, uh, we're just gonna move to the last one, which is appearance. And again, this is just personal preference. Set the text types that you like, usually something a little bit larger for the title, and then maybe something a little bit smaller for, for the header text, and then something even a little bit smaller than that for the body text. All these other things are just personal preference. I like to have a little bit of a differentiation between rows, so I add a check here for the first row stripe color, and then I just do something that's just a little bit off-white, again, just to kind of help me see the difference between the different rows. So having clicked that, now you can see the finished result. And then as we usually do with schedules, we just drag them onto our sheets. And I'll go to the finished example for that. So now you can see the final display here of the massing diagram with the labels and with the schedule that displays, most importantly, this was kind of our uh, objective, display the uh, floor area ratio here for the assembly of all the floors. In addition to that, you can also see here uh, a display what the FAR would be for each of the individual floors. Now, just to demonstrate that this is parametric, we can go back to our 3D view and we can change something about one of these floors. So I'm gonna to go to my uh, 3D view here that was used in the diagram. And I can click on, let's say, for example, my fifth floor, and I can edit the boundary of this. And I'll be able to do this in a 3D view. And let's just say that I move this out a little bit to make that fifth floor residential tower space a little bit larger. If I click on the green check, uh, and go back to my schedule over to my sheet you can see now that it makes the adjustment and I've got a slightly larger fifth floor and what was 2.12 is now 2.16 so this is just a demonstration of how we can use Revit's good parametric capabilities to not only display that information initially but to see it update as we make changes to whatever our masses might be Final step to wrap up here is I'll just kind of explain what I had done with the graphics to make it look the way that it did. This is something that kind of matches what you may have seen from uh, architecture firms like Bjark Ingels. This is kind of a popular look right now. In order to get this kind of heavy vector look, all I did is just go to the uh, annotate tab, sorry, the modify tab. And I just clicked on this little line work tool and I selected the wide line style. And then I just clicked on each of the outlines uh, of this uh, set of of floor types. And I'll just kind of do it here to show you how the editing works. If I make that initial click, you'll see that each end of the line has a blue dot grip. So if you need to, you can move those around so that you get just the extension of that line that you want. And if it's not quite the right thickness, you could manage that by just going to the Manage tab, selecting Additional Settings, choosing Line Styles, and then just set the line weight for whatever line type that was. So as you saw there, uh, it was a wide line style that I was using. It's set to a line weight of nine. If I was to change that to something thicker, like let's say 12 and click apply, you'll see the result behind there. So something that again is parametric and easily editable. So that's it. Uh, that's the process. That's how we arrive at something that looks like this. And that's a good way of sort of working through those uh, iterations in an early stage when we're trying to test our design ideas against the uh, requirements that we might have from a municipality about uh, floor area ratio. So hopefully that was helpful. Let me know in the comments down below and stay tuned for future videos.